to episode six of the David Bernard podcast. I'm along with meteorologist Zach Fredella, and we have a lot to talk about today. I've been waiting to do this interview for some time. Uh, we're going to be talking to Colin Arnold of Orleans Parish Emergency Management, and we have a lot to talk to him about, including what happened yesterday. Uh, this is being recorded on May 13th, and yesterday we had a tornado in Orleans Parish, of all things, something that's really not that uh, common, but it does occur from time to time, Zach. Yeah, I mean, it, like we were just talking about it, since this is the first tornado to actually impact Orleans Parish since 2019, so it's two full years that we've gone without an actual tornado recorded in the parish. Now, it happens pretty frequently all across southeast Louisiana, but this one tracked right over the heart of the city. I mean, right into downtown, some damage was reported even at City Hall. So uh, an interesting track and fast, fast moving, one of those crazy fast moving uh, tornadoes. It was really fast. In fact, uh, here's a little background on what happened. And of course, we can compare it to 2017, the New Orleans East tornado, the strongest tornado on record to uh, hit Orleans Parish. And uh, according to the Weather Service, if we go back to 2000, so over the last 20 years, there's been 10 tornadoes in Orleans Parish proper. So that would mean about every other year. Now, 99% of them have been like what occurred yesterday, an EF0 tornado, not like what happened in 2017, which was an EF3 tornado. They estimated the winds 150 miles per hour uh, with that particular uh, tornado. And, you know, the thing that's so scary about uh, what happened uh, yesterday and, of course, in New Orleans East tornado is the damage potential. Uh, if we go back to the New Orleans East tornado, that funnel started developing right before the Industrial Canal. Uh, the wall cloud was over Metairie, it was moving east, and that funnel dropped and hit the ground as it went east of the Industrial Canal and south of Interstate 10 along Chef Highway. So it did move through at least the lower populated areas of New Orleans East. Uh, but you can imagine if that tornado of that magnitude was on the ground in Metairie, in Mid-City, along Interstate 10 in New Orleans East, what the potential could have been. I mean, it's crazy to think of it like that. We've talked about this many times with that EF3 tornado. If it was, if it dropped to the ground maybe three or four miles earlier, I mean, the, the devastation would have been you know, almost catastrophic for, in a sense. And thankfully, with both of these tornado events, uh, no deaths. And that, that's, you know, but they're two totally different things. You know, with an EF3 during the middle of the day, we could track it. We could see it. This thing was rain wrapped and it happened in a matter of seconds. Everybody that was interviewed yesterday said, one second it was blowing like crazy and the next second it was over with and that goes to show you how fast these things can occur and we always talk about this when the tornado warning is issued don't try and go outside and record it everybody wants to do that nowadays and chances are here you're not going to see it. it it was incredible here's the, the back story on what happened for folks that may want to know what was going on uh generally you know i work the nights uh monday through friday uh, Shelby Latino works the mornings, and so when we have this overnight severe weather, I stay till about 2 in the morning. She comes in, picks up the coverage from there. The same thing you do with Nicondra on the weekends. You guys split the mornings and the nights for the severe weather coverage, and then, of course, we bring in uh, extra help when needed. And so I was leaving the station. Shelby was coming in. The line of storms were moving in from the river parishes. There were no warnings on this. Uh, we had a couple of flood advisories out. Uh, there were a couple of storms earlier in the evening, which is why I want to stick around, that kind of had these notches on them when they were in Assumption Parish and just west of St. James. And I thought, well, things could get a little suspicious on the leading edge of this line of storms. So literally, I leave the station, Shelby comes into work, I get to my house, and about five minutes after I get to my house, I hear this roar. It was, and I knew it was strong wind. It did not last long. It maybe lasted a minute. At most, I don't even know if it lasted that long. Uh, and to be quite honest, I was exhausted. And so uh, <laughs> even my meteorological curiosity couldn't get to me, and I went to sleep. So I did not know until the next morning what had transpired, but that tornado track had gone about a mile north of my house. So I, what I had was, was probably some 50-mile-per-hour winds that suddenly – uh, blew through my neighborhood, which we know now we're closer to 85 mile per hour winds. But the track went right over the station and uh, the Kentwood building. I drive by that on the way home at night where the uh, roof peeled off of it. So uh, the tornado was about 15 minutes 
uh, behind me. Uh, kind of a scary situation. And we've looked at the velocities on it, and it, it tightened up right over, you know, Carroll, the Carrollton neighborhood. It tightened up there, came right across Fox 8, even though we had no damage here, but right down the street, that Kentwood building saw some damage, and then right through downtown, and then eventually it made it to Algiers Point, but lifted before ever making it to St. Bernard Parish. But it, it's a classic example of when you have these squall lines, they can be producing absolutely nothing for, for miles and miles, and then all it takes is one little spin up, which we get quite frequently, and in the wrong place, and in this case, it was right over the city in the most populated area, and it does some damage. 85 miles per hour winds that fast with the tornado. We saw multiple um, areas that's, that saw the power lines down and huge trees, huge oak trees uh, just fall and just knocked right over. And the telltale sign for me was uh, our news director was taking pictures of the damage yesterday morning and went down to the Kentwood building and part of the aluminum, the metal roof that peeled off, one piece of it got wrapped around the telephone pole, which is just really a classic damage signal you see uh, when you're doing forensics, trying to determine if this is damaging straight line winds or if it was a tornado. It's probably a combination of both yesterday. Uh, there might have been some straight line wind damage in there as well. And these also might have been, you know, kind of like a Gus NATO type situation. Uh, tell us a little bit more about those. Yeah, because, I mean, because it was so, when I say, I don't want to downplay any type of tornado because it was so weak. When you're talking about EF zeros along a line like that, it could have just been a strong wind gust that spun up a little bit uh, faster right on that leading edge. And um, look, I mean, 80 miles per hour, 85 miles per hour tornado or 85 miles per hour winds, they're going to do about the same damage. But you mentioned it. A lot of the damage we saw with the, the actual metal roofing and all, it was twisted in a way. And that's one thing. When they're looking, when the National Weather Service goes out there and they, they go out there for all of these damage reports, they determine, okay, well, if things are twisted, that's chances are that it was a tornado that did that because tornadoes twist. We all know tornadoes twist and that they actually twist the damage as they pick it up. Okay, well, on that note, today uh, we're going to talk to Colin Arnold, as we were discussing. He's director of the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness for the city of New Orleans. Uh, big job. And uh, as we'll discuss with him, he has had a lot of challenges uh, the last two years. In fact, just about anything I think you can throw at an emergency manager, uh, he's had to face, whether it's from the building collapse at the Hard Rock to, of course, the pandemic, the hurricanes and uh, cyberware attacks and everything else uh, in between. So uh, on that note, uh, let's bring in Colin Arnold. Uh, well, now we have our guest for the day, Colin Arnold with the City of New Orleans. He is Director, I say, of Emergency Preparedness, but of course, uh, the title now, Colin, is much bigger than that. It's the New Orleans Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, but I'm kind of an old-fashioned guy. I mean, you guys are still doing what you've always done, right, despite the longer title. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we just call it NOSEP. You know, we love our acronyms. So uh, we'll call it NOSEP for short. I, I can't do acronyms. On TV, people always want to put acronyms on. I'm always like, nobody in the right. public knows what those acronyms are. I don't even know what most of them are. Well, I got to tell you, uh, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast uh, for some time because I don't know if there are many emergency managers in the country who, in the course of 24 months, uh, have faced a building collapse, a significant building collapse in the heart of their central business district, a cyber attack on the city's infrastructure. Uh, we've had multiple hurricane threats and, of course, the pandemic. So, obviously, a lot to talk with you about today. But, of course, how about timing? Yesterday, we had an EF0 tornado go tornado. through the yeah. middle of the city. Uh, how do things stand uh, today on that, and, and how do you feel the city response was to it? I thought the city's response was really good uh, as far as, you know, coordination, and probably for the same reasons that you just kind of ran through the list. We've had a lot of practice over the last 18 to 24 months. And so, you know, it's funny, we, we, we do this whole workup for hurricane season, which is kind of ironic because really down here, hurricane season's a year round kind of uh, sport, you know, where we're constantly uh, preparing in different ways for hurricane season. But the April, May timeframe uh, is always that time where you're really doing a lot of training and planning, presenting things to the mayor and kind of doing after action and just looking at you pro and, uh, 
we've kind of we're doing this training but really it, it's to the point right now where it's like if you don't if you haven't gotten it by now uh you may never get it you know because we have been tested and so yesterday what you saw was a very combined and coordinated uh you know response to what fortunately uh although damaging turned out to be a you know a relatively um uh not a major incident and no injuries or you know obviously no one hurt which is the the first call i made at three o'clock in the morning 2 45 in the morning is is anybody hurt you know any any reports of injuries and the answer was no so you're seeing you know you're going to see some debris for the next few days and we're going to get that picked up and you know you'd have seen some uh you know minor to moderate damage to some homes and cars which we always are concerned about but overall um, it's worked out very well. And I would also give credit to, to our utility, electricity, utility, energy, New Orleans for you know, a real coordinated yeah. uh, response and a quick response. We, we were down at about 300 people without power this morning from 10,000 last uh, yesterday. Yeah, you know, Zach, uh, you were talking about this earlier before Colin came in about the impacts of a tornado on an urban area uh, and just how fragile everything can be. Yeah, and it really it doesn't happen that often. I mean, because you got to realize in a city is such a small point. But in this case, Colin, I mean, this thing went right through downtown. Literally, it started in the Carrollton area, across the the northern side of Uptown, and then right into downtown in Algiers Point. Yeah, and we get with the weather service really quickly in these events. Um, the last one we had uh, significantly uh, with with damage was. Um, I believe right but the day before Barry, we had some flooding and there was a tornado that went down uh, basically down wisner kind of uh yeah along bayou st john and um it's always amazes me uh, just to see how they can just kind of drop down do some damage pop back up drop down and just make that track uh like you said right through downtown and then jump the river and go over into algiers and that's what we're seeing right now is Carrollton neighborhood there around Pine and Cone and uh, in Algiers Point uh, around Opelousas and Bounty. That's the two areas still that are s still lingering with some power issues that will be fixed today and and was probably the most damage we saw in, of any particular area. So we've got a ton of stuff to unwrap here, right, as, as, as I put forward to you. But let's let's kind of start with hurricanes. That's really our existential threat here in southeast Louisiana. I mean, right. the, the one thing that we've seen before and is always the most immediate uh, looming threat. And let's talk about this this past season. And, of course, uh, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about this on our Weathering the Storm special about how unique the issues were with Laura, Sally, and Zeta and what the implications could have been uh, for southeast Louisiana. But let's start with Zeta. That was our big direct hit um, last year. It was our first hurricane. Uh, since Isaac. So we went uh, eight yes. years without a hurricane, which is really kind of getting a little bit on the outside of uh, uh, what you might expect as far as return frequency, as far as a, a category one storm. Uh, what what was it like once Zeta got here in light of the fact of what we had already been facing for the last couple of months? It's we take something different from every storm and certainly zeta was the one that uh for us uh highlighted uh infrastructure you know you saw tremendous um power outages after isaac in 2012 uh at that time uh the coordination between energy and the city uh, as far as tree trimming was there but maybe not completely solidified uh, that storm solidified that partnership that has continued for a decade uh, as far as our parks and parkways and energy working together to you know while we enjoy our tree canopy that is amazing in this city it also needs to be maintained because uh, it, it can do a lot of damage the trees can do a lot of damage to power lines and wind um, that energy also upgraded electrical infrastructure after isaac because they had to and so we believe that kind of paid dividends as far as restoration after Zeta, which I, 
talking like inside baseball when you're dealing with a national presidential election and over 200 polling stations without power, most of the city without power, and just the um, the conversations between the state and the city on getting power and and energy back and getting power back um, in order to have uh, a presidential election four days after the storm. Uh, it was it was monumental and we had a plan together and assets in place to actually provide generator power to every single polling station in the city if we had to uh and fortunately we did not have to use one they were all staged out uh, at uno lakefront arena ready to go a lot of props to the state and to energy in particular uh, for getting all of that together but we ended up uh, they ended up being able to restore the power in most of the city um, uh, enough to where every power on election day, which was just terrific. Yeah. And you so know, when I look at Zeta, sorry. No, no, I was I was just going to say, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I totally forgot about that aspect of the storm. I totally forgot that this was literally days before the presidential election. Uh, and, and so, I mean, no, just thanks for reminding me that. And just also how fragile the infrastructure is. I mean, that was really, uh, you know, I think what it really exposed is how much we rely on power even more now than 30 or 40 years ago and making everything in society uh, actually function, Zach. It, one thing I wanted to kind of to follow up on with Colin is, was that a plan that was already in place or did that some, was that something you had to come up on the fly where you needed to get generator power to every one of those sites, one of those polling places, or is that something that was, you already had that kind of in, in the works in the event that something catastrophic was to happen? Well, I think Colin uh, is frozen up for uh, just a moment here. In fact, uh, I'm going to take him out for just a moment and see if we can get him to dial back in. It might be the best way uh, for to get him to come back out. So we're going to uh, go back to that in just a second. Let me see, uh, Zach, if I can. No, I can't do it that way. So we'll do it like we'll keep it up like that. And hopefully uh, Colin will get back with us in just a minute. But that was really the weakness uh, in this whole thing was the the power situation and the fact, uh, you know, of, of, of how easily uh, the power was lost across the area. So, Colin, uh, I see you're back here. Um, I'm back. Yeah. Talk more about that, about uh, it, that's what I think Zach and I were trying to get across is that, you know, oh, my gosh, it was just a category. Basically, it was a category one with category two gust over the city and it was moving so fast. We're so reliant on power today. I, t I try to stress this with people all the time that the modern day hurricane has so many more implications than it did 30 or 40 years ago because we rely on power for everything. Yeah. I, and so it actually, you know, as you just probably saw this week, they actually upgraded it to a category three which uh, on the coast, which uh, winds over 100 miles an hour, which makes it a major landfall and fortunately over the city the winds were less but i think what was even more fortunate about zeta was that it was extremely fast and dry relatively dry um, our our scenario that we're really um, focused on and, and are worried about is that harvey type situation where you have a category three even a lesser category that is extremely wet with rain and causes us issues with our drainage and with flooding and so um, Zeta was quick moving. The question about the plans, we get questions about plans a lot. All hazards plans are written in a way that you can adapt them when you need them. So while we didn't have a specific plan for, it's gonna be a national election and you need to have generators over 200 places around your city, we have plans that kind of assign responsibilities to different agencies, the fire department, secretary of state, I mean, from, from federal to state to local, that all kind of indicate if something like this happens, a power issue, how can we address it? And so now, having gone through this, you have a basis to actually, you know, kind of annex that out and say, like, this is a good election strategy have to have this type of situation during an election again so it works out covid was similar you know you have pandemic plans but 
uh, with with everything going on over the last year, a lot of those plans were found to be uh, not enough. Yeah, Zach, why don't you uh, address what Colin was saying, and let's talk about Laura and Sally. And I'm going to have Zach kind of talk about it from the meteorological uh, standpoint of the rapid intensification during Laura and then the slow movement of Sally and what those could have meant for our area. And then, Colin, you can kind of talk about what you guys were doing uh, in the middle of those hurricanes. Yeah, I mean, like Laura and Sally were two basically the worst case scenarios for the city of New Orleans. And at one point, we were basically in the middle of the cone of both of them. But Laura would be a category four and New Orleans would be catastrophic. doesn't matter how fast it's moving, really. And then Sally was supposed to be a slow, slow moving category two that just crawled right into southeast Louisiana in the first days when the track was coming out. Slow moving means flooding. We know that. You just mentioned that about Harvey. And then catastrophic category four means, okay, you have all hazards on deck and you can have significant problems. You know, what from a from a preparation standpoint, uh I know it's all those storms probably blend together last year, but from uh, the days ahead of Sally, the days ahead of, ahead of Laura, I mean, were y'all prepared at this point where we, we could take a category, you know, a significant major hurricane or we could take a very slow moving storm? So Laura and Marco, if you remember, was going to be the one two punch. So that mm -hmm. added a whole different dynamic of is it even possible? And of course, the, it's rhetorical. The answer is yes, it is possible that we're going to get hit by a hurricane and then a day later get hit by another hurricane. And, and after the year we've had in 2020, it was kind of like, why wouldn't that happen? You know, and, and, and it didn't. Uh, Marco fizzled off the coast. But uh Laura presented significant challenges that we looked at as far as exactly what you're saying. It was kind of the perfect recipe of wind and water that would be an issue for us. I will say that with Laura, we realized um, in a relatively, we had, we had preparations done and, and we're at the point now in the season when we're in the L's where we've already had a few dry runs of tropical storms and other subtropical things happening that you know we've got our things in position we've got our assets lined up we've already been going through covid so our emergency operations center has been activated um and so we felt comfortable with that fortunately the timeline with laura and the cone moved where it became pretty certain it was going to go to southwest which presented us a whole other issue with we're then working with the state and the federal government to help the people in southwest louisiana our neighbors so Laura became, as I said, we all get that kind of one takeaway from the storm. Laura became the sheltering storm. And so we ended up sheltering 12,000 people at one point in hotels, up to 40 hotels downtown in a non-congregate setting uh, because of COVID. And so now that has been added to, as we mentioned, planning has been added to the state's overall sheltering plan because it did work. But obviously there was concerns when Sally was a factor that you've added 12,000 people to your city's population that may need assistance in evacuating. You know, it, it added a significant challenge to what we were already doing. And I will say for me, Sally, is that storm, uh, as I think you said, Zach, uh, people are like, they're all running together. I've had people tell me like, oh, I totally forgot about Sally. For me, Sally was probably the most, that one that I was most concerned about last year because of the track because of the the amount of moisture in it uh it looked kind of like a mixture between a, an isaac and a gustav on track wise and um you look at the damage that it caused in pensacola the bridge is still out there um, another infrastructure type challenge uh, sally would have been an issue for us uh i think just because of its track and the what we were doing to assist our neighbors in southwest louisiana with sheltering i mean that, that was, was uh, we were we were lucky with sally i that i agree with you completely colin the sally storm stressed me out the most because we had yes. slow movement track uncertainty and intensity uncertainty I mean, Sally right. blew up at the last second as well. And here you have this meandering storm that could be kind of wobbling into the marshes of St. Bernard, which is just the absolute worst approach uh, yes. that we can have yes. for, for Lake Bourne and for Lake Pontchartrain as far as, as far as water. So you brought up the Laura evacuees. I mean, this is what I'm talking about, another layer, the exact scenario 
We were worried about it at the beginning of the season. Everyone was doing their hurricane specials about how is COVID going to impact uh, the hurricane season, and boom, uh, there we had it. So you added 12,000 people to the city. Uh, how, how many people do we typically prepare for that might need assistance with evacuation? And is something like this cooked into the equation beforehand? We plan for 35 to 40,000 New Orleans residents that will need assistance. And again, last resort, you have no other way to get out. Uh, medical mobility, financial transportation constraints mainly, um, 35 to 40,000. So, you know, our concern clearly was that we were going to add 12,000 to that number. Now, having said that, the 90% probably about 90% of the evacuees that got here from Laura were mobile. They had vehicles. So we did have a little bit of uh, reprieve, if you will, there as far as if we did have to tell people to leave, they had transportation. But we still had people with medical challenges, mobility challenges in the hotels that we would have had to add to our number to, to get out. We did that. We actually added those people to our special needs registry that we keep for the city uh and just in case we had to go and had to tell people to for a mandatory evacuation and call for it we would have been able to identify where they were so let's let's shift gears here now and talk about the pandemic um as i we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast here uh, we've had the cyber attack on the city you had the building collapse with the hard rock we've had the hurricanes you know, and then, of course, we had the pandemic. And so almost everything that an emergency manager can have thrown at them has been thrown at you the last couple of years. Obviously, we have things like terrorist attacks and, you know, we can get in all kinds of horrible things uh, that, thank goodness, have not occurred as of the point in time. But the pandemic, that's something that most of us did not have a concept of, that we have not had a devastating global pandemic like this in a century. Um, I'm sure these are things that you learn about and as you're training as emergency managers, but I have to believe until it actually happens, like with a lot of things, you don't really know what you're going to be up against. It's absolutely true. Before we had had uh, H1N1, uh, swine flu, uh, and, you know, I guess that the nearest would have been Ebola, which you know, occur in far off areas of the world and your chance to interact with that virus or that, that issue is, is not as great. And so the numbers were so much smaller when you were doing your planning for, for those different types of, of pandemic or medical type, um, you know, disease vectors that, that can possibly come into your city. Um, when, when we started talking about, um, the coronavirus, uh, you know, we were we were thinking small in those same numbers, you know, like, oh, we may have a hospital where 10 people show up or, you know, that there may be a hotel with 100 people, you know, it, it all just was irrelevant at that point once once the true nature of this became evident and once the just amount of sickness uh, and death, unfortunately, and particularly in the beginning, um, started occurring. It was clear that this is something that is going to affect the entire world and that we were certainly not going to be immune from the effects from it. And then it became the issue of PPE, um, getting getting the communication out to the public. And I think that, you know, NOLA Ready is something that we're very proud of here. Um, the ability of the public to uh, tell them to social distance, mask up, get tested when it was testing, and now get vaccinated uh, when it's time to get vaccinated. And it is time to get vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, um, just to kind of think back on when all this was beginning, uh, I am no expert on pandemics. I mean, I'll be honest with you on that. Uh, but I, I'm not I, either. But I have read about them. I had read about them, uh, and I had read about the 1918 flu pandemic, and I had seen a talk show on pandemics about 15 years ago with a guy who'd written some books about uh, what the fallout can be and how it can expose how fragile our society is and how fast things can really become unraveled. And thank goodness we've 
mostly been able to contain some of those really bad outcomes uh, that can yeah. happen. But I'll never forget Mardi Gras Day, and I was down there at Gallier Hall, I'm with Lee and Kim, and they just started seeing some of those cases in Seattle and California. There was like the first three or four were confirmed up there. And I just looked around at all the people, and I said, this is coming here. I just said, yes. I, I just, you know, we didn't know what it was. I just, we didn't even know the tran- how it was transmitted, that it was purely so airborne. But I just thought, this is not going to be good. And that must, that must have been so scary that first month. It was. Uh, the timeline just did not work in our favor with information. You know, at the time, even up to Mardi Gras Day, this was, it was still, you know, we're doing what we can uh, with travel restrictions. Uh, it's not going to come to the U.S. Uh, it's the flu. You know, the flu kills more people. Uh, a lot of that messaging. And then what we saw was really the first c- confirmed community spread case was, on, I believe, on the West Coast on Mardi Gras day but it was clear that 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 mardi gras was a super spreader incident for the city and that probably from travel and tourism uh, you know unfortunately that 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 did occur you know but i will say on the high side that the community really responded when we asked them to once we became when, once it became clear that new orleans at one time you know we had an extremely high spread rate and death rate well, like globally um the community responded and did what they needed to do and we really did crush the curve uh, and we've had some bumps in the road as a, as a city and as a state and as a country with you know uh, things popping back up again but i remember uh with uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA and having to order uh, 20 uh, refrigerated uh, freezer semi-truck rigs. And I didn't have a place to store them. And we were fortunate enough to be able to find a location, but just uh, what really put it in perspective for me. And this was because what was predicted to overrun the hospitals with fatalities. And Seeing all of the 20 parked in a huge parking lot um, and knowing what they were for um, really was a point for me that put this entire thing into perspective. And uh, if you didn't think it was real before, um, it just became crystal clear that, you know, our lives, this is going to define us for generations. Let, and fortunately, we, we did not have to use um, we did not have to use all of those trucks. We did have to use some, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, fortunately, it it was not the the death was not as dire as we uh, as we had, had been working at, you know, or as has it been predicted. Yeah, and there was no way at the time to know it. You just had to plan the way you had to plan, Zach. Um, Correct. You have been really, and Zach's been really involved in, in, in messaging and social media and, and just how we get out messages out over the air, whether it's hurricanes, the pandemic. Um, Zach, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we message for these things today? And I guess, Colin, will bring you in. I kind of want to get your take on, is everything easier now for you or for us uh, because of social media and um, apps and things like that. Yeah, because we have like so much misinformation out there on social media. And, you know, Nola Ready is one of those great tools. Y'all are on Twitter. You know, y'all are through the text messages. You know, y'all have a website that you can go to. We, I mean, It's a great tool, especially with flooding, where we can literally go almost in live time and see how flooding is popping up on that map. But, you know, maybe talk a little bit about we struggle as meteorologists. Not only do we have to try and get the forecast right, but how do we message to the public? And the same story is from a emergency preparedness communication aspect. How do you message properly for every different type of event that can transpire? And like we've seen over the past two years, every event almost has transpired. It, it's a double-edged sword because there is, you know, you do have to be very careful with uh, the veracity of, of some things you see on social media. We have had instances where uh, people have uh, used social media to show images of previous uh, hurricanes uh, and, and have 
promoted that as what's occurring right now. Um, that becomes pretty clear to us, and we've got some pretty smart people that look at this. But one of the things that we that I noticed a few years ago and knew that this was going to social media was changing everything was we had a house collapse uptown uh, nobody was injured um, but we got a tweet about it uh, three minutes before the first 911 call came in and i'm like this has power you know that this this is a force multiplier for us and so you know i have a great team i have an incredible team that uh, looks uh, and works with uh, these platforms and works with our alert system and our whole goal is to have trust with the public. So, you know, to put out the best information that we know, when we know it, and, and when we're, we've verified it, and we can say this is, you know, to the best of our knowledge, which we know we're dealing a lot of, with weather, and I don't have to tell you guys, weather is, is very fickle. You know, um, we've had numerous, you know, we lift parking restrictions, we do these different things, and sometimes things don't turn out the way you thought they were going to. But at the same time, I want to make sure that a person doesn't lose their car. That's my goal. Um, and I'd rather be more cautious with that than less cautious. And then you run this fine line of, am I over notifying people? Am I, am I causing complacency by sending out too many messages? And so we really do try and, and focus on um, being as reliable as we can with the public. And, and I would add that we have uh, this week debuted a new um, alerting system in the city. We're going with a new vendor called Rave Mobile Security. Um, there's a lot of functionality there that we're going to be able to really, I think the public's going to be really happy with. Uh, what we're doing is asking people to text NOLA Ready, one word, NOLA Ready, to 77295 and get started with that. Anyone who is in our previous alert system will be migrated over and will be given the option to link in and keep going with this new provider but we're really excited about it i'm already i'm already registered colin i started getting the alerts awesome. and in fact it's of amazing course. was it yesterday the first day it's or the two days ago pretty much we uh we, and, we were shooting for may 15th to be completely um completely done and and kind of transferred over and and I will give credit to our previous provider. Uh, they, they've been great with us. Uh, it's just we're, we're moving on to a different system. But um, we, yeah, pretty much what you're saying is absolutely true. Um, we've been we've been testing the heck out of it over the last two days. And our new yeah. vendor is like. So we got, we got the boil well, water advisory, know, the tornado. <laughs> with New Orleans. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we didn't even, <laughs> the boil water, is the boil water advisory still going? It is. It is. Until this <laughs> afternoon, it'll probably, it'll probably be cleared up. But yeah, the yes, new I vendor's kind of like, wow, you guys were serious. Because we said, you better be ready. I mean, it's New Orleans. <laughs> we are, we have constantly something going on. And, and we do the same thing for special events like Mardi Gras with our alerting. So, you know, it's only going to get bigger once we really start recovering and start getting back into special events in the fall. Okay, a couple of things I'm going to close on here. Uh, thoughts. We've had 40 inches yeah. of rain so far this year. Double are, are typical. Incredible. And so at this time, are you just telling everyone to leave their car on the neutral ground for the rest of the year? No. <laughs> the parks and parkways will kill me. No. That, that, that is an issue. The, we love the neutral grounds and the green space we have and the can tree canopy, but it, it neutral ground parking tears those up. It, it has a tendency. Yeah. So we always ask people to be really careful when they're pulling on and off because think about it, it's usually wet ground uh after so when people leave the neutral ground it tends to cause problems so we try to use it as sparingly as possible but um you know it is an option when we when we enact it we try to be really um you know uh, as early as we can with it when we know that there's going to be some rain issues because you know for people getting to work and their cars is, is a lot of times their livelihood and we understand that you know um, obviously flooding yeah. the house is a totally separate issue but it, it, it is something that we care about in as a as a government you know we want to see people get through these things the the best way possible okay and of course um your uh, bio was sent over uh by your assistant and I'm like well i guess i don't know everything about Colin. i see you're a licensed commercial pilot I think that's was, interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, meteorologists, I, a lot of us are licensed pilots as well. I'm not, 
but I have several <laughs> several friends who are. So uh, I don't know. Maybe you can take Zach up in a plane sometime. <laughs> I could. I, I actually am a flight instructor as well, and um, it it was it's been part of my uh, since childhood uh, love of aviation, and really ability with the weather. Uh, as a pilot, uh, your your number one concern that you are looking at all the time is weather. So there are, there's a lot of uh, crossover between uh, doing this job as emergency manager and working in the transportation field that um, d- relies heavily on having accurate weather. And so um, this job kind of makes you a weather nerd. I, I love looking at the weather, um, but that job as well, uh, if-, if it's bad, you can't fly, you know, and that goes from the, the 747 down to the Cessna 152. All right. Well, you're in good company, Colin, as far as weather nerds go. Thanks so much for being on the podcast today. And uh, let's hope we've reached the peak as far as disasters go around here. And maybe we can get a little bit of a break uh, this season coming up. I hope so. And the pandemic uh, keeps improving. But I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to both you and Zach. And, and, you know, over the years, we've, we've done a lot of stuff with hurricanes before the season and everything. And that's always open. Uh, It's good to see you guys. Okay, you too. Thanks for coming on the uh, program. Thanks. So there you have it, uh, a man that has been very busy and he has faced a lot of complicated scenarios over the last two years. And uh, just like that, Zach, boom, June 1st is a couple of weeks away. And that it is, you know, another hurricane season. But good news. I mean, there's a little bit of good news from this season as the NOAA just declared that uh, La Nina is no longer. Now we're going into a neutral phase. Now many might be wondering, okay, what does that mean? We always talk about La Nina, El Nino. La Nina years with hurricanes usually produce a lot of hurricanes. We saw that last year. We had a yeah. very strong La Nina, and that's what happened. I don't like La Nina. Okay, but what it looks like we're going to have, it does not look like we're going to have an El Nino. In fact, uh, Noah's saying the chance of an El Nino is only 8%, and El Nino tends to suppress Atlantic hurricane activity, except in, womp womp, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, The Gulf of Mexico is kind of really immune from a lot of large-scale climate factors, just because of where it's positioned uh, in the basin and the way that we can get some of these storms developing. Uh, So we're probably going to be in a La Nada, Uh, Not a La Nina and not an El Nino. So I called it the big nothing, uh, which means uh, we'll be looking to other factors like uh, dry air, wind shear, and ocean temperatures to determine what's ahead for the hurricane season. So, of course, we've got our hurricane special coming up in a couple of weeks. And on the podcast next week, we are bringing in the entire team. Okay, so uh, that's going to be for episode seven. Uh, Obviously, we've only done six episodes. So, no, no, this we're on episode six now. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So that'll be episode seven next week. And um, we're going to have all five of but, us on. So, But uh, I was saying five of us. There's five of us coming on. Oh, right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> all five. And uh, all five who like to talk. So I think it should be a very lively conversation. We're going to be previewing our stories for Weathering the Storm uh, 2021. Uh, again, thanks for listening and thanks for watching. A reminder that you can get the podcast in the same place you get all your favorite podcasts. And if you aren't watching this and you want to, you can go to fox8live.com slash David. And we have the video podcast version of this available there. For Zach Fredella, I'm David Bernard. Thanks for coming along. <laughs>